Hi there and good morning. Uh, good afternoon to other areas of the world. I'm very excited to introduce Allison Williams, who is the SVP of Digital Operations and Strategy at Forbes. Allison's going to walk us through what th th they just announced, the Forbes One first party digital platform that's helping them with their community across all channels. But Allison is in charge of um, advertising operations, ad product yield and inventory management and sales operations and analytics teams. But with that, I'm going to hand it over to Allison so she can walk us through their new product. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I think we have a really great couple of days lined up and I'm looking forward to kicking things off. So um, as Heather mentioned, my name is Allison Williams. I'm our SVP of digital operations and strategy at Forbes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our new first party data platform, which we've called Forbes One. So um, for the past 18 months, I've been part of a cross departmental group at Forbes that has been building out our first party data platform, Forbes One, which we just recently officially released last month. Uh, building this was really the result of a number of things. A big factor, of course, was the state of the digital industry and user privacy concerns, um, which we'll talk about a bit later. But additionally, the wealth of data that we really have access to and wanting to use that to build better experiences, both for our audiences and for our marketing partners. Um, so a first party data strategy is not something that can be developed quickly. And we've really been working towards ours for almost two years now. Um, our first iteration was built in 2019 and released to our sales team as about 20 different intent audiences in January of 2020. Um, now, I remember this day well because I was actually scheduled to present it at our annual global sales meeting. And about an hour or two before I was going on stage, news broke that Google had announced the deprecation of third party cookies in Chrome by the year 2022. Um, so this announcement from Google made what I was about to share even more important because at that point and still somewhat today, third party cookies are what many media companies rely on for audience targeting. And without them, the entire ecosystem is going to change. Um, that makes first party data absolutely essential. Uh, so since that announcement, we've adapted our product immensely. Um, we've grown our intent based audiences. We've added demographics and communities. And I'll talk about all of that a little bit more. So as you're building a first party data strategy, uh, it's really important to know your audience. That's an essential key. So I want to talk a bit about ours. Um, Forbes is a robust portfolio of platform and products. We hit records with our digital audience last year. We, of course, have a strong print product. Um, in a year that had no in-person events, we had over 50,000 different event registrations. Uh, we also have more than 40 free and paid newsletters. And we really believe that no other major media brand reaches the entire spectrum of people who have made it. So it's the billionaires and the business leaders of today and the people who aspire to make it. Um, and we'll make it in the future. So really the next generation leaders. So that brings us into our communities at scale strategy, which is an essential piece of Forbes One. We are really focused on consistently growing our audiences and developing deep relationships within key categories like CEOs, CMOs, CFOs, and CIOs, as well as entrepreneurs. And of course we have our under 30 platform, our Forbes women platform and many more. Um, we really believe that the elasticity in our audiences is something that's very unique to us and what truly underpins our Forbes One first party data strategy and sets us apart from others. So when it comes to building these communities, and I'm talking about the CXOs, Forbes Women, under 30s, financial advisors, we really want to make sure that we're creating the custom experiences that they're looking for, no matter what platform, and that we're offering them opportunities, whether it's via a virtual event, a digital subscription product, a private Slack channel, um, a newsletter, whatever it is that they can't get anywhere else. When it comes to building a community, the brand, of course, has to be authentic and relevant. And a critical component there is going to be the editorial. Um, I want to use under 30 as an example. So 10 years ago, our chief content officer really changed the conversation around millennials. Millennials were thought of as entitled, as spoiled, as helicoptered, but he saw them instead as game changers, as trailblazers, as something to be celebrated for the way they would shape the world and the way that they were going to disrupt industry, industries that had really been legacy that hadn't changed for a long time. Um, and that's how Under 30 was born. 
We took our brand, we added an editorial component, and that brought the audience. Um, and we continue to engage with that audience. As an example, just with our latest list 10 years later, um, we created individual profile pages for under 30s that each, each lister can log in, they can update it, they can use it as a networking tool similar to LinkedIn. Um, we did the same for our financial advisors who appear on our wealth lists. These are just ways that we're cultivating each of the communities that we're really focused on. So what does that mean for first party data? Well, in order to build a first party data platform, your audiences need to keep coming back. They need to trust the brand and they need to want to repeatedly engage with it. First party data is the result of our audience taking action on our platforms. So developing that sense of community and that sense of trust is really key. When it comes to Forbes One, we're using data derived from across all of the platforms I've mentioned our digital subscriptions, our virtual and live event registrations, newsletters, e-commerce, e and maybe most interesting, um, we, we actually have just straight up asked our readers if they would provide us with more information about themselves in exchange for a more relevant ad experience. And we've had an incredible success rate with that. We're basically taking all of these touch points and passing them off to a team of data scientists who are building out sophisticated models and algorithms that analyze more than 70 different data sets and draw out behavioral and, and intent preferences and then feed them back into Forbes One. So to dig into more of the details, we have three different types of data available within Forbes One. First, we have our intent data. We're using artificial intelligence to evaluate every single piece of content on our site. And then we're using more than 600 different data points to bucket our readers based on their interests, their affinities, think personal finance, luxury auto, enterprise technology. Um, the second category we have is our demographics, which really let us identify things like job title, age, and income. And that's done through zero party data which is data that users have given us directly and through sophisticated lookalike models that have been built by our data science team. Uh, and then, of course, we have the segments that we believe are the true differentiators for Forbes, our proprietary community audiences, which are so representative of our core audience and so unique to our brand. Um, we really wanted to highlight the audiences that we reach in a way that only we can. Our cross-platform content goes deep with these audiences and allowed, has allowed us to create relationships with them. First party data is really all about a value exchange. In order to make our consumers feel comfortable sharing information with us, we need to create innovative experiences that provide an incentive for them to share with us and to engage with our brand. And of course, and importantly, to engage with our marketing partners. Uh, this is really central to our community strategy, which is why we've connected it back directly into our Forbes One product. I've already mentioned our under 30 community, financial advisors, Forbes Women. These are all cross-platform franchises that give us access to these individuals. And we keep adding dimensions to this through new editorial products, like our 50 over 50, which launches this year in partnership with Mika Brzezinski, or our Next 1000, which really spotlights diverse entrepreneurs from all backgrounds and industries. Um, in building these communities, we learn more about them and about how we can reach these key groups. And this has really become the bedrock of our Forbes One platform. So when we have all of this data and all of these audiences, how do we really use it to move our business? Uh, if you think back to the slide I showed earlier, it was very similar to this one. It displayed the many different platforms within our portfolio that help fuel Forbes One. That really is another key piece of Forbes One. The same products that are providing the insights to develop our data sets are going to be the ones that benefit from the insights that we're feeding back into it. Of course, the most obvious place here is display ad targeting, where we're able to build media buys that can give advertisers the very specific audiences they're looking for. And we've seen great performance on these campaigns so far. But we're also able to give both marketing partners and our own editors and journalists insight into our content. Who is reading what? What else are they interested in? What else do we know about them? This all helps to create content that we know a certain audience is currently interested in or engaging with. And of course, we'll use the same data to influence our newsletters, our events, our subscription products as well. Our relationship with our audience is one that we've been cultivating for 103 years. They trust us, and we put that trust at the center of everything. Um, when it comes to building a first-party data product, trust is key. And while each product, each audience, each platform may be different, 
With Forbes One, we're really building the tools and the data structure we need to tell a compelling story on each one of them. So that's the end of my official presentation for today. I'm excited to chat a little bit now with Heather and to go into more detail. Um, my contact info is here, so please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Allison. That was terrific. I'm, I'm very passionate about data. Um, when I ran a, uh, a brand called uh, Manufacturing Enterprise Communications, my, my rant was always vision to decision, start the conversation early and stay there. Like, you, you know, it's 10 to, now it's 18 to 20 touch points before you can get your prospect to engage with you. And for, the, for what we're doing, we wanna know what the audience wants. So we have to start listening to the behavior. Um, but, well, one of the things though with that, a big question that came up as your presentation, you were going through your presentation is, you know, there's the behavior part, right? Your AI is listening to what people are doing on your site, but there's almost also, there also is a machine learning component, I, which is different than AI. So I need to try to understand, you know, the person's going to, let's say, um, a white paper download for on some topic, right? But I need to say, okay, is that behavior indicative of a buying intent or is that more information gathering? How are you addressing that? Sure, yeah, so I think um, one action is really not putting you in any bucket. It's really multiple actions that that are gonna help drive what how we're segmenting our audience. Um, so so that single download, that, that may be a clue for us, but it's not gonna say, okay, this person is buying whatever it is they were downloading. Um, so I think it's really, for us, it's key to look at, look at the larger picture. And I think that's why we really are honing in on on trust and the overall experience because a person who comes to the site once and takes one action isn't giving us enough to really make that something that we can we can target after that we can create an audience around. It benefits us for people to keep coming back, to keep taking action, to keep you know engaging with us. So we really want to um, figure out what what can we get them to do you know, how do we keep them here? How do we keep them happy? How do we get them to do more? And then we can learn more. Yeah, and, and I love the fact during your presentation, this the importance of editorial and, and the editorial really is the core product. You know, I know everyone says content's king, it really is. And you need to have trustworthy, um, yeah. you know, domain experts. I love the way uh, the 30 under 30 created, not just it's a tone of voice and it's understanding the way they want to engage and showcasing them. So, uh, but going back to the strategy and how it de you developed it, you, you talk about bringing in multiple stakeholders. And one is, you know, can you emphasize how important that is and who were those stakeholders and why were they so important to developing the strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I think I love that question because this really is something that had so many different people from so many different teams participating. And I think that's actually something that we're really proud of at Forbes. So we've kind of for the past few years had like a internal rally and cry that we say hashtag one Forbes. So we're kind of saying like we are one company. We're not, you know, a separate business side from our editorial side. We're really one group working together. And even kind of in the name, Forbes One is a bit of a spin on that. And I think the product was very much a result of that. Um, so of course we have an amazing business intelligence team. We have engineers who have worked so hard on building this out. Um, they were really crucial and you know did a lot of the heavy lifting, which we're so thankful for. Um, but in addition, we had input from our marketing team, our revenue team, our, obviously I'm here from our operations, our revenue operations team. Um, we worked with editorial, we worked with product, we worked with tech. It was really someone from every side of the company because we wanted to produce a product that would help them all. Um, I, think, I think it would have been easy to try to replace third-party cookies with something um, basically the same as what what third-party cookies did, but we wanted this to be something that really kind of involved our full, our full, you know, tech stack. That this is even somewhat integrated into um, 
our CMS. So into it's we our CMS is Birdie. We built it in house, but we want to be able to give our editors and our journalists those insights. So it was super important to have everyone's involvement and to really now keep them involved and keep them aware of what's going on, so that we can be providing the best insights that you know we possibly can and and growing and changing our product as we need to. No, that's so, so, so important. Um, a quick question on, have any new roles been created within the organization due to this new product? Yeah, actually. So we created, and as far as I know, we not there's not a whole lot of other publishers that have done this. Um, we actually took one of our sales, our sales reps and um, he is owning now, he's our new VP of data sales. So we have one person who's literally dedicated to building out the selling of this product, making sure um, it's usable, working with our clients on it, working with our marketing partners on it. And that's an investment for us. Like we, we're, we're backing this, this is big for us. Um, and so we really see with that new role, and not to mention, I mean, I think we've brought on additional people in, in tech and BI and other areas as well, just because there's a lot of maintenance that goes into it. Um, but we really have invested here and we want it to be something that, that sticks around. I mean, we want this to be kind of our, our next game changer. That's how we see it. That's so smart about the sales role. Um, you have your, your domain expertise. Many times a new product gets launched and they throw it at the sales team, go sell it. And, 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 and even though the product could be super viable, it, the sales team hasn't, you, you need yep. that, that, that advocate. That leads me to my next question, which is, with that said, um, what you know, you've talked about the advertising. So you've, you've got a laser focused way for advertisers to hit and pinpoint people that they're looking to reach. Are there other things that have evolved from a revenue standpoint due to Forbes One? Like what other products, new things that you're selling in the market and value? Yep. Um, and you know, this, we officially launched last month. So this is still very much a work in progress. There's a lot of places where we plan to take it. Um, I think a lot of the insights that we're going to get from Forbes one are, is it a key place that's going to benefit many of our different platforms in our businesses? Um, so once we know, uh, like what do CIOs do on Forbes.com? What are they engaging with? That allows us to create better um, content marketing for our, our brand voice product. That allows us to find the correct people to be inviting to our events. It you know, allows us to market our newsletters to the right audience. It really lets us build out these niche audiences that, that we really didn't know what they were doing before or maybe as much about what they were doing. Um, so there's really a ton of, of potential here for the product and for really, I think, making a difference on our um, on our overall bottom line. It, it really is all about marketing efficiency. I mean, if you talk about waste that happens right now and marketing to the wrong people, um, exactly. so, so I, I love yeah. that. So and just looking at our you know digital subscription product and how you know who's who's subscribing, who do we want to be getting that? Like these insights are huge, so it's really exciting for us. Well, we got Ralph here. Hello. Hello. Hi, Alison. Uh, great presentation. We've got, first of all, we've got some poll results. So let me show you those. Uh, we asked, what role are you in? And 23 of you responded. And it seems that a lot of people are in other. So I'm wondering what other is. Um, but Heather, I mean, is that the sort of results you were expecting? What, uh, you know, what were you seeing? I think the other is kind of throwing me off there. I wish we had had a fill in the blank. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you take the other out of it, and it's it's going up, um, is uh, you know, marketing executive leadership. So that's a that's a fair representation. I would definitely like to see more digital transformation on there, but um, uh, no, okay, we need to find out what other is. Yeah, I mean, I see lots of people taking part in the poll now, so it's on the streaming tab. Uh, on the right hand side, and I think we'll publish the results. I'm going to switch to the audience questions. So the first one I'm going to choose is, uh, which has been upvoted three times. So it could be a tricky one. Does Forbes one differ under European Union GDPR regulations to how it operates in other parts of the world? So do you have to deal with different uh, legislation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Forbes one specifically would 
technically be the same, but what we do in order to collect data does, of course, differ in different parts of the world. So, you know, we, um, and I don't know the numbers offhand, but there's likely a bit of a smaller scale that we can do in, you know, say the UK um, than maybe we have in the US. But it's, it's very much built to be a global platform. So it's available, you know, to our sales teams, no matter where they are, our Europe sales team, our Asia sales team, our full US sales team as well. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other questions as well. So uh, Miro is asking, are you planning a live event this year or cheeky one? Uh, and if so, how will how will your audience react to this? So are you planning any live events? Um, we right now are, are just following the guidance of the, the governments. Um, we don't have any, uh, we would love to be able to do live events in the end of the year. We don't know for sure whether that's going to happen yet. I think there's a lot of unknown across the board. I, I wish I had an answer to that. I think we all do. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, and let's go to the bottom one here as well. Are you using third party integrate, uh, sorry, third party partners to enhance your intent information or identity resolution companies to enhance your website visitor insights? Yep, great question. Um, we actually chose for Forbes One to build an entirely internal solution. So we're not working with any uh, third party companies to build it. And that's really because we wanted to own it. We wanted it to be built exactly how we needed it and we wanted to have control over it. Um, and so it was a very intentional decision that I think really ended up working well because of how we wanted to build out the product. You talked in your presentation, um, I mean, I was interested in the Forbes Women program, the diversity. Is there a kind of recipe that you apply every time you're looking at a new community? Or is it the other way around that you spot, start to spot trends and then you think, oh, there's something in that? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, a lot of it really happens authentically for us. I mean, when when you brought up women, I mean, so a lot of people don't know this, but actually in the first issue of Forbes magazine in 1917, we had on our cover and a whole section devoted to women in business. So it's something that we've been passionate about for a long time. I think what's key for us is not to find the hot topic, but to find something that fits in with, with our brand and with the stories that we tell. Um, and I think having that really authentic approach is what makes it really succeed in the way it did, it, it does for us. Um, so we, we're not just going to hop on the bandwagon because a lot of people are talking about something. We want to be thoughtful. We want to integrate it with our brand. And we want it to really work for our audience. You also had, uh, you had a, a slide which was like a circle with virtual. Virtual events is the one I picked on, but there were different things going on there. Um, do you have any tips for people who are trying to get into, I suppose, digital marketing and community building? Uh, perhaps not for the first time, but I mean, if you look at social media, there's so much that you could do, paid promotion, organic. Uh, it's a job in itself, um, if not a job for two people. What are your tips to start building something in this world for event? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. I think, I mean, for fear of repeating the same words, I think authenticity and trust are so important. And what's really going to be successful is to find what makes you different. Um, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of talk now about, you know, in the in the digital media space, you know, about Google and Facebook really owning a lot of the market share and how to, where does that leave everyone else? And I think the key there is just to differentiate yourselves, to find what makes you different from you know, the bigger players or the more established players and kind of hone in on that. And that's really what we try to do. And I feel like that's where, um, where you know, if you're not the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, or if you're just starting to try to build something, that's what can kind of make you different. Well, I don't want to steal all your thunder, Heather, but those are the questions from the audience. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, if you're a little bit confused as to how Brella works, we're on the stream tab. So if you want to ask questions, get involved in the polls, you'll find us on the stream tab. Uh, and next up in about six minutes time, it's the real event producer uh, with my colleague Mike from event.video. So in that session, we're going to hear from Funnily enough, some real event producers telling you their stories. But Heather, back to you to wrap the session up. 
Uh, well, thank you so much, Allison. I think this was really helpful for the, you know, the audience and any type of event organizer who's looking to build community as well as media companies who are trying to connect the dots with their data. Um, and uh, any last comments you'd like to share? Uh, no, just, you know, have a great rest of your event. I'm excited that I was able to participate and I'm looking forward to hearing more. Um, actually, one last point I wanted to make to you is I actually, you know, we, we're bringing Tonya Edelman uh, from, uh, Tonya, Tonya Reese from Edelman about their trust barometer. And one of the things I've noticed about Forbes is that you actually, as a brand, are taking a stand on points of view and helping the world become a better place. This, this report's going to be very interesting for you because people actually, that's what they're looking for right now. Yeah. So, so anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Okay. okay.